So, you want to buy a plane. But you want to know what plane to actually buy, where to find that plane, and of course, how much it's all going to cost you. Well, that's what I want to help you with in this video today. See, this is the Biggin Hill Air Show. I used to go here as a kid every year when I lived in England, watching the displays, gazing up at those red arrows flying above me. Yes, that's me, watching the displays back in 1982 when I would spend my summers in the UK at air shows like this, dreaming of one day becoming a pilot. Fast forward several decades. Now I'm a qualified pilot and I'm lucky enough to own my own plane. It's this one. Echo Yankee Zulu, a second-hand Cirrus SR22 built in 2007, which I bought in 2019. I've owned it for just over a year now as I record this, and in that time I've learned quite a lot about what it's like to own, to manage, and to operate your own aircraft. The good things... and the bad things. So today I wanna to share with you some advice and pointers on what it is actually like to buy your own plane and how to go about it if you're thinking of taking the leap. Now, my good friend Philippe is not only a flight instructor in the UK, but he's also a professional aircraft broker. He buys and sells planes for a living. So I figured if anyone is gonna be able to answer the question, how do you buy a plane? It's probably gonna be him. Philippe, if I would have come to you before I bought Echo Yankee Zulu, what, what would you have told me? Where do I start like in buying a plane? The first thing is, do you, do you want to own or do you want to have a different structure of getting your aviation fix? It can be your local flight school, right? You might just be a renter for life, which is totally fine. Um, and sometimes the economics make that easier, right? Or you might be in shared ownership or you might be in a non-equity ownership group or it might be full outright 100% ownership, or you might have a buddy who you want to uh, get into ownership with, and then it's just the two of you guys sharing the fixed costs on, on, on an airplane. So that's, you know, thinking about what structure of ownership is probably uh, a, an initial first, you know, first port of call. And so, but how do I know which plane like is gonna be right for me? Because I, I'd flown Cirrus before, right? So I was kind of leading that way. And then I found Echo Yankee Zulu pretty quick and I did jump into it. It's like the first plane I flew and tested and it's the, the plane that I bought. But how do, how do you go about deciding which is the right plane that you should buy? People will always talk about define the mission. Okay, so what is it that you wanna do will determine ultimately what airplane you end up buying. You don't buy a sports car to move house. You don't buy a truck to bring your kids to school in the morning. Defining the mission is many things. How many people you're gonna carry where you want to go, like what it is you want to do. Do you want to fly inverted? Fly to your second home regularly? Like, are you taking lots of friends? So defining the mission, I think there's many facets to it. And then you're not going to find the airplane that does 100% of that list. Is that airplane is the elusive bird. It doesn't exist, right? So find one that's 95% of what is on your top list of requirements for the plane. Now, just before we go on with that chat with Philippe, just on that list of requirements, I distinctly remember emailing a list of requirements to Stephen at Blue Demon Aviation, the maintenance company who look after Echo Yankee Zulu, with a list of my priority A and priority B items. And I found that email. I thought you might be interested to see what my requirements were before I actually went ahead and bought the aircraft. So priority A, you can see, I've got that it needs to be IFR certified, which Echo Yankee Zulu is. I put down Ficky flight into known icing, which I ended up not going ahead with. Echo Yankee Zulu is not a Ficky enabled aircraft. It has basic ice protection, but it's not legally allowed to fly into known icing. I wanted a traffic alert system, which it does have a digital autopilot. Well, it has the DFC 90 built in. And I put in there the ability to fit an extra tank in the back for around the world, which the Cirrus aircraft can actually do. Then the priority B items in the email were things like a metal prop. I didn't want to have a composite prop because I thought the metal would be more durable. Air conditioning, which was a nice to have. I actually ended up getting an aircraft with air conditioning in, which is a real nice to have, especially in Australia. Barrow VNAV, which I now have with the GTN 650s that I put in afterwards into the aircraft. XM weather, it doesn't have any sort of weather or, or anything like that in the, in the aircraft at the moment. Jefferson charts in the MFD, no, nope, it doesn't have that either. I use Jefferson charts on an iPad and managed by Blue Demon, which the aircraft actually is. So you can see from that list of priorities, not everything that I originally wanted from the aircraft is in the aircraft that I now own. 
But I was lucky because I knew that I wanted to buy a very specific aircraft. I was looking for a Cirrus SR22. But what happens if you don't know what aircraft you want to buy? What happens if you don't have enough experience in different types of aircraft to narrow it down to the one that you want to purchase? That's what I asked Philippe next. It's probably because you haven't experienced enough, right? So invest a little bit of, of capital up front and you know, beg and, and barter for rides in different types of aircraft. And if you haven't had that experience, then you really can't make that informed decision. So if, you, if you're waffling on, on the defining the mission bit, then maybe it's just because you haven't flown enough different types. So try, try before you buy where you can, yeah? Try and get rides from friends and stuff in, in their aircraft. Exactly, exactly. And you know, sometimes you'll have to pay for that. Going for those little test days and like investing a little bit in that exploration, it's going to make you so much happier down down the road. Well, I found the plane. I know kind of what I'm after. I've, there's one available. It's right for me. It meets my mission objectives. But what are the options then when it comes to financing and, and actually affording this? Yeah, no, that's a listen. That's a great question. And, and there's a lot of hidden costs, even just before you even own the airplane, depending on the size of it, there'll be a lawyer involved. There might be an escrow agent involved. You know, there's potentially you're using a buyer's agent, which I would highly recommend, right? They do transactions over and over and over and over again and understand all the pitfalls, especially if it's your first airplane. But there are finance solutions out there, right? And aircraft ownership doesn't have to be a big money game at all, right? There are airplanes out there for 15, 20, $30,000. And, and they don't depreciate at that point. They're not depreciating like cars, right? And that's, I think, a big point, right? If you're putting in 30,000, 40,000 into an airplane, it's not like as soon as you take delivery of that, that pre-owned aircraft, it's worth now 20,000. You're just holding value in the plane, you know, at the end of the day. But what are some things that you should really consider for, you know, an ongoing budget for flying? The biggest ticket items are finance. Then you have insurance, which is, most likely your next highest number. Hangering is a big expense and your annual inspection is normally also a big expense. The way to learn and the way to define those numbers are to talk to people, right? Talk to the mechanic, talk to the previous owner of an airplane that you're interested in, like really try to get in touch with the owner himself. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to talk directly with the seller and, and get a bit of uh, insights to what you know, the, the proper ownership costs have been in, in the past on that on that specific airframe. A lot of the big OEMs have very active ownership groups, right? Cirrus has the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association. TBM has TBM OPA. Uh, Piper ha has, I mean, they, you know, they all have uh, ownership groups and, and some more active than others, but on those, you'll find lots of insights. I want to buy a plane. I've got a rough idea of what I want. I've got a kind of budget that I've got in mind, but I've got no idea where to start looking or what the process is. How would you kind of map out the steps then? Kind of to answer that elusive question, how do you buy a plane? I'll tell you what, it's really difficult and you should seek professional advice wherever possible. <laughs> um, no, no, I mean, in, in all honesty, uh, you know, the process can, can normally be quite simple, right? And there's a, there's a title on the aircraft that's owned by, you know, person A, and that title needs to be changed to person B. Where there are complications is where the, the transaction is international, right? Or where there's a re-registration of the aircraft onto a different aircraft register. That can get quite complicated. If there is finance, then that's also, you know, can increase a bit the complexity. You know, if you're buying a pre-owned aircraft, you know, it's prudent as the buyer to seek a pre-purchase inspection. So if I've decided to go ahead, I do want to buy the aircraft, can you, do you honestly think an aircraft can be considered an investment that you would get money back from? Or is it an investment in just yourself and you're flying? To say that an aircraft is gonna go up in value is, if I said that, it's probably not true. <laughs> I mean, there are, there are some, right? If you look at Super Cup values, I don't, I don't know why, but they keep going up. But is it uh, an investment, you know, you, I don't think so, right? You can probably put that money in um, in the stock market and, and get significantly better returns. Most airplanes will depreciate. Yeah, and you know, the cost to keep an airplane going, you know, so every time you start the engine up, actually it's costing quite a lot of money, right? So you wanna, you wanna make sure you're enjoying it, right? And that should be the principal reason for getting into aircraft ownership is that there's actually a utility to it. And that might be an enjoyment utility. It might be a business utility, right? But there's a reason for it. If you've got the option to buy, should you? Should you rent instead? Should you rent or should you buy? How do you make the decision between renting and buying? 
So, so there's nothing like getting to your airplane and your headset is already plugged in and your flying glasses are already in the in the pouch and your checklist is where you want it and it's clean. Like there's there's no feeling like that, right? Where you and you 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 must feel it every time you open the hangar doors and you see Echo Yankee Zulu sitting there and your heart flutters and you're like, ah, everything's in slow motion as I skip towards it. That feeling can't can't be replaced with renting for sure. Right. But just on the pure economics of it, I, I generally say that if you're flying more than 60, 70 hours a year, then owning starts to make sense. There's not a hard rule like n nobody come down on me for for giving a, a hard number because it's not a hard number. Right. It depends very much on what aircraft you're looking at buying. Sit, sit down with someone like yourself and do the calculations. Exactly. And that's I guess that's part of this defining the mission bit. Right. It's like if you're going to fly, you know, 150 hours a year. Right. Or if you're using it. If you have a very specific purpose, right, which is that you're 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 looking at an airplane to get to the the lake house, right, or to you know to get to the second home, then a flight school is probably not going to be the right solution for that. If you're going on that sunny weekend and you're flying two hours to the lake house on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's sitting on the ground there, and Monday morning you're flying it back, the flight school is not going to be happy with that. And actually owning that air, uh, renting that airplane. If you're doing that consistently, is actually going to start mounting up the costs more than if you just own the plane outright. If you're not subscribed to the channel, do consider clicking on this subscribe button here. It means a lot to me to see the channel grow and helps me do a lot more here on YouTube in the future. Otherwise, thanks as always for watching.